Good afternoon, and welcome to today's event. Haiti Today, what is the path forward for international community assistance? I'm Wazamala, Associate Director and Fellow of the Caribbean Initiative here at the Atlantic Council. Thank you to everybody joining us today virtually and in person at our Atlantic Council studios. Uh, we're delighted today to be joined by the Assistant Deputy Minister of the Americas for Global Affairs Canada, Glenn Linder. Adrian Linder, welcome, and thank you for taking time out of your day today to join us. Our conversation today comes at a critical time for Haiti and the broader challenges facing the Caribbean. As many people would know, Haiti faces a multifaceted crisis, and it's only worsened over the past few years. Gang violence has spread rapidly, and the country's political situation has contributed to an economic and humanitarian crisis. Still, we've seen movement toward a solution, led jointly by CARICOM countries, of which Haiti is a part of, and Canada and the United States. This moment, this moment appears to be an all-hands-on-deck situation, where all partners of Haiti must work with Haitian stakeholders to bring a long-term solution to the country's crisis. What is being created, but needs to be sustained, is an international architecture that must keep Haiti at the forefront of all global policymaking and support. This is not just for the direct benefit of Haiti, but also for the Caribbean countries that are playing a leadership role in this space. If small countries are expected to lead, then they need access to the resources and support that allows them to sustainably remain active in Haiti. So today, we'll get an update from ADM Linder of where things are in armed violence, um, political discussions on the transition and progress towards the organization of elections had stalled uh, as the gangs continued growing uh, their control over the capital in particular. And in Georgetown, as you mentioned, where I was, um, CARICOM leaders were really seized by that. I mean, this is... Uh, this is their region. They were concerned with this region, as are the rest of the countries in the region and many around the world as to what's happening there. Um, and then what happened was, uh, shortly after that, uh, on February 29th, while Prime Minister Henri was traveling to Kenya to sign the agreement for the deployment of the multinational security support mission uh, in Haiti, the situation deteriorated significantly with coordinated gang attacks against essential infrastructure and symbolic institutions and uh, subsequently the closing of the international uh, airport uh, in Port-au-Prince. Um, on March 11, CARICOM again took the leadership, convening Haitian political actors to reach a political agreement uh, in Kingston in the presence of CARICOM heads of state and government and members of the international community, including Canada, the US, France, uh, other like-minded. Um, and following that meeting, uh, key Haitian political actors agreed to establish a transitional presidential council. The conclusion of the agreement uh, was a watershed moment because it was signed onto by a broad range of political stakeholders from Haiti um, that had not been able to agree with one another on um, on one before. Um, and what was so key to this agreement was that even although the airport in Port-au-Prince was closed and people from Haiti couldn't travel in person to be in Kingston, they were brought in by Zoom to really be part of that because what we're all clear about when it comes to Haiti is that we want Haitian-led solutions. We want the Haitian people uh, to be able to take control of their destiny and to determine their destiny. Um, and I can tell you that... Um, Canada, the U.S. have been uh, working hard to, to bring uh, folks uh, together for a long time in terms, of, in terms of getting to an agreement. And I must note huge thanks to the U.S. government for their significant leadership uh, in this space. Uh, but it was really gratifying, finally, to see this come together. And so this transitional presidential council that um, uh, that uh, has been put together will include representatives from Haiti's main political uh, parties, the private sector, the religious uh, sector, civil society, and will in turn be responsible for appointing a transitional prime minister um, and a cabinet of ministers. It will also be responsible for naming a, provi a provisional electoral council um, and as you might have seen from the announcement coming out of Georgetown, uh, the idea is to have elections before August 31st, 2025. And I know some people looked at that date and said, well, that's, that's awfully far away. But the assessment from the experts um, uh, at this time is that it's going to take time in order to have the basic structure, the basic infrastructure in place in order to allow those free and fair elections to take place. Um, and, the, and the sense is that it's going to take at least 15 months to get there. 
But CARICOM has announced that they will do a needs assessment mission um, in collaboration with the United Nations, supported by Canada and the United States, to determine what is needed. And if there's any way to get to, get to elections sooner than that, um, uh, I think everyone recognizes that that's, that that's what's um, needed. And of course, the other part of this agreement is that um, on March 12th, Prime Minister Henri announced that he will tender his resignation when the Transitional Presidential Council takes office, and that resignation will take effect uh, once an interim prime minister is appointed. So it's going to be, it is going to be a challenge. We need to, to recognize that uh, Haiti has a very dynamic political culture, um, and it's going to be challenging for members of the new governance structure to work together, and, it'll, and it could take time, and there could be bumps in the road, but I know that, that Canada and other members of the international community um, stand ready to support them, to work, to, 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 to help them restore security, help them restore uh, govern constitutional governance in the country, and get to those free and fair elections. But of course, we have to be realistic. And we have to accept that the appointment of the transitional governance structure isn't instantly going to solve the security crisis in the short term. Um, and in fact, many armed gang leaders have said they oppose it. So we should expect that they will continue their violent activities. And this just highlights the urgency of implementing a security uh, solution um, so that we can really move forward with alleviating the huge amount of suffering that exists in Haiti. Yeah, th thank you. And, and you know, I think that point about you know elections being about 15 months away, you know, it's it's a long period in the international system where lots of things happen on a weekly basis. You know, sustained effort, right? Consistent effort is going to be really important. And I know this is something that uh, Canada has been doing prior to you know everything you just mentioned. You know, happened within the span of a few weeks. Yeah. Um, but Canada has been very active uh, here on, on on Haiti for quite some time. So, can you share a little bit about what Canada's support has looked like? to Haiti over the past few years? And how, how are some of those policies and that assistance changing over time as things in the country itself are starting to develop and more actors and partners are coming on board? Yeah, no, that's a really, it's a really important point. So Canada obviously has very strong links with Haiti. We have a significant uh, Haitian diaspora population in, in Canada as, um, uh, as um, uh, sibling uh, francophone countries within our hemisphere as well. So there's there's lots of historic, cultural, linguistic ties between Canada and, and Haiti, and we have been uh, very much uh, engaged in Haiti, trying to uh, move forward to address the acute political security and humanitarian uh, issues that are facing the country. And so I'll maybe respond to the question with respect to uh, to talk about development, uh, development assistance, security assistance, and then, as you said, in terms of more recent development. So with respect to, to development assistance, um, really, we've been investing a lot in this space. I can tell you that, um, that uh, since 2022, Canada's committed over 300 million uh, Canadian dollars um, in new international assistance funding uh, to Haiti. And what we've really been doing there is, is targeting the basic needs of, of people, whether it be with respect to emergency food and nutrition assistance, water, sanitation and hygiene, health, uh, environmental re remediation and protection, um, uh, and um, uh, health, uh, health services, but particularly in response to gender-based violence, which is a huge problem in, in Haiti, as well as institutional strengthening program to fight corruption and impunity uh, and to strengthen the judicial sector. So that's on the development side. On the security side, We've we've really uh, we've really tried to take a leadership role in this space in terms of strengthening that security sector, and we've done it in two ways. Firstly, we've announced an investment of 100 million Canadian dollars to directly support the Haitian National Police in terms of equipment, resources, and training. But more than that, we realize that Canada does not operate in a vacuum. We have put in place what we call the International Security Assistance Coordination Group. So this brings together 30 donor countries and organizations um, who all have an interest in this space and want to help in Haiti. And so what we do is we work directly with the Haitian National Police to, to get from them what their needs are in terms of equipment and training. And then we coordinate among donors to figure out who can provide what mm -hmm. to meet those gaps that have been identified. And if there are things that the HNP needs that we can't provide, that none of us can provide, we figure out who's best place to try and mm -hmm. 
be able to provide that. So that's on the security side, um, and that is going relatively well. Um, I should say on that that in the context of the more recent escalation in violence, um, the, the, the priority has really been to maintain coordination efforts um, to, to urgently get some of those necessary resources to, to stabilize uh, the situation. Um, and then with respect to, to more recent uh, needs and the, um, and the imminent, we hope, deployment of the multinational security support mission, um, Canada has announced uh, that we will provide a fairly significant um, financial contribution to that. Um, again, really want to salute U.S. government leadership in terms of uh, U.S.'s financial contribution um, to that. Um, uh, because really getting that uh, security support mission uh, in place is going to be uh, very helpful to, to addressing the security situation. The last thing I would just mention is sanctions, mm -hmm. um, and that is something where Canada has really been focusing on in terms of making sure that we impose sanctions on those who are fueling uh, violence um, and instability in the country. And so we've put that regime in place. Um, and um, we really want to emphasize that we do not tolerate those actions. We've encouraged other countries to do the same, uh, and we know several have. Uh, and we're working um, with the UN to ensure those efforts are, are, are multiplied. Thank you, Adrian Linder. Uh, you know, that, that point on donor coordination, I think, is extremely important. And, and, and you know, seeing that it's going really success, it's going really well in Haiti, it, it seems, you know, at a broader regional level, this is an issue that we face across every sector, every country. There's lots of people doing lots of different things in these different countries, and this coordination aspect is really important. Um, you know, as our Caribbean initiative, we look at energy, climate, food, you know, et cetera, and this is the persistent problem, working with many different multinational partners and seeing that Canada is having is a success story when it comes to Haiti, right, especially on this international assistance side. And one thing that we always try to do, particularly at the Atlantic Council, is to show the international community, you know, if you're not interested in the Caribbean, why should you care? Right, and I think this kind of goes to the point of Haiti. Haiti is in and out of headlines, although the crisis in Haiti continues. Right, so why is regional and international assistance important when it comes to solving some of the crises that come with Haiti? And then sort of as a, as a follow-up, what is that sort of partnership, that collaboration with some of those Haitian stakeholders that you mentioned and other CARICOM leaders going to look like going forward to make sure that there is a sustained effort when it comes to Haiti? Yeah, I mean, I think you're putting your finger on a, on a critical uh, issue there. Um, and so in terms of the, the international assistance part, I think we're seeing some, some, some reasonably good coordination uh, happening uh, through the International Security Assistance Coordination Group. Um, we're, we're looking for results out of that as well. It's not mm -hmm. enough to simply coordinate. We want to see the results uh, on the ground. But, but ultimately, whatever we do as an international community, we've got to continue emphasizing the importance of solutions being Haitian-led and Haitian-owned. Uh, that, is, that is so important. But, but we're at a pivotal moment in, in Haiti's uh, history. I mean, the healthcare system is near collapse. The access to ports and freedom of movement have been uh, severely reduced. Air services, both humanitarian and, and commercial, to Port-au-Prince are, are, are not currently operational. And gang violence is having a significant impact in, in Haiti, including murders, kidnapping, and, and sexual uh, violence. So we've got some, we've, we have some um, recent early progress that can attest to the benefits uh, with Haitian partners. And again, I would point to the fantastic leadership of CARICOM in terms of bringing those leaders together um, from Haiti um, under the auspices of CARICOM to really get uh, to an agreement. Um, and I think that that uh, is not the end of the process. It's the beginning of the process. But I mean, it's that kind of it's that kind of approach that I think is is going to be most helpful um, in order to be able to uh, to help. But of course, we want to see the agreement again implemented uh, and put in and put into place. Um, I think the other the other key points with respect to to engagement um, or to to international assistance is engagement with with other uh, donors to to ensure that. Everyone is aware of the critical importance of Haiti and and what's happening there, and the the need to uh, 
the need to act on that. And then again, engaging with Haitians themselves, with Haitian leaders, with civil society in order to understand uh, the needs uh, and to, to really help where we can in terms of feeding those Haitian-led and Haitian-owned solutions. In terms of, um, uh, in terms of the the follow-up points you made, uh, look, the um, uh, I, I think what it, what 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 it will look like will very much depend on the implementation of that political agreement, and we we just have a, a, a really strong hope that 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 political agreement will lead to the reestablishment of full constitutional government um, uh, in the country, um, and that um, uh, and that that will enable all of us to have a Haitian state uh, with which we can engage in a robust way to really determine mm -hmm. those determine those needs and, and to support its success. No, no, that's great to hear. And you know, you taught at the, you know, you spoke at the top 15 months until elections, right? And going back to this point, making sure that there's consistent engagement on Haiti, it's top of mind for global policymakers. The worst thing that can happen is that two weeks from now, nobody's talking about Haiti, right? right? Because the people in Haiti are still suffering. So. What are some of the things that Canada can do, other partners like the United States can do to ensure that this is a conversation that's always top of mind, right? That we don't go two weeks from now in the next, uh, you know, next bilateral meeting, multilateral meeting, and it's talking about something completely different and people have forgotten about Haiti. What, what can we do to ensure that in those 15 months, there's gonna be continuous engagement and conversation around Haiti? Yeah, I think that's... That's important. I can tell you that in Canada, Haiti is top of mind for our policymakers, for our political leaders, uh, starting with the Prime Minister and our Minister of Foreign Ministers of Foreign Affairs, uh, Melanie Jolie, and our Minister of International uh, Cooperation, Ahmed Hussein. Um, they are very much um, uh, focused on Haiti and uh, the needs of Haiti, and to Canada being a steadfast partner and friend for Haiti as we have for decades. Um, and we will continue to play a leadership role in bringing international attention and, um, and commitment to advancing solutions to returning Haiti to, to stability um, and, and constitutional uh, order. And I again acknowledge um, uh, the, uh, the huge leadership that the U.S. has also taken in this, this space, but I, I won't speak for the U.S. government, I'll speak, I'll speak for Canada. Um, and I'll just say that there are as you were, as you were, I think, alluding to, there are so many serious humanitarian crises happening around the world that are capturing the headlines, um, and I think it's appropriate to be concerned that the situation in Haiti is also very serious, but is perhaps not garnering the international attention it it deserves, and while. Canada and the U.S. have put a lot forward in this space, both financially and in terms of in-kind support. I, I would use this platform to, to say to all donor countries um, outside of our region, please look at Haiti, consider what mm -hmm. you can provide. This is about the stability of our hemisphere, it's about the stability of our world, and it's about a, a, a really serious humanitarian uh, need. So I would, I would really... Um, I would really emphasize that point. Um, I mean, look, we've we've made efforts to maintain international momentum through consultations, through convening several high-level meetings, ministerial meetings, um, policy discussions on security in Haiti uh, were held um, constantly uh, during high-level meetings that Canada's had with CARICOM, including at the Canada CARICOM Summit that we held last October in Ottawa. Um, and we're going to continue to ensure that Haiti remains on the agenda of upcoming meetings. Um, recognizing the current instability in Haiti is an important issue for, for all of us. Um, we'll continue to play a strong role, um, an advocacy role with respect to Haiti in key institutions, whether that's the Organization of American States, the UN, La Francophonie. Um, I can tell you that our ambassador to the United Nations uh, in New York, Bob Ray, has been very engaged and represented the Canadian delegation at the CARICOM meeting in, in Kingston and at other meetings. Ambassador Ray also chairs the UN Economic and Social Council's ad hoc advisory group on Haiti and takes every opportunity to, to encourage partners in the region 
and beyond to step up assistance to Haiti uh, to address its host of political security, humanitarian, and socioeconomic challenges. We, we need to work together um, to support a comprehensive um, and, uh, and coordinated approach. No, thank you. And uh, I'm going to ask you a follow-up question thinking about this idea of you know, bringing, you know, Haiti top, keeping Haiti top of mind. Who are some of the actors that we need to involve there? You, you mentioned that the U.S. and Canada is doing a lot. Uh, what about some actors outside the hemisphere? Ha, has there been engagement? And, and this is, you know, you know, outside of what we, we were planning to discuss, but I'm just interested. You know, France, the European Union, have they been, have they already been playing a part? And then, you know, outside of that, has there been sort of a driver in the sort of the Haitian diaspora that you mentioned in Canada, or what what role have they been playing? So, with respect to the to the Haitian diaspora, um, I would again I wouldn't want to speak speak for them, but but there is engagement with the, with the Haitian diaspora in Canada again at senior political levels in 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 Canada. Both our Prime Minister and our Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, engage frequently with the, with the Haitian diaspora in in Canada. So, um, you know, stay stay very much in touch with them, and uh, and that's very helpful in terms of informing uh, how we're how we're engaging as well. Um, but with respect to to partners further afield, look, I can tell you uh, again. I don't want to speak on behalf of other countries. Uh, I, I can tell you that 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 France has been um, very much at the table um, as another like-minded partner. Um, they were represented at senior levels at the meeting in in Kingston um, as well, um, and I know that they have that they have um, offered a contribution to the to the multinational uh, security support mission. Uh, there are likely others, mm -hmm. um, but but we need more. It's it's going to be an expensive mission, but it's going to be money well spent if it means that we can really um, return to to a more secure Haiti. And if I could ask you on the on the MSS. Um, has, there, has there been conversations with uh, the Kenyans here? And I know that, of course, they're playing an important role. What is that? Has there been any form of communication since you know a lot of these recent events have transpired? Um, look, the conversations with the, the Kenyans are, are ongoing. They're dealing with their own uh, internal processes in terms of deployment and timelines and so on. Um, I think it's. Uh, it's fair for, for the Kenyans to want to have some level of certainty as to what, what government is in place in Haiti um, uh, so that they can determine uh, their, determ th their deployment uh, timetable. But uh, I'm also aware that many other countries have, have come forward um, uh, and agreed to provide uh, uh, troops uh, under, un under Kenyan leadership for that and just hugely thankful to those countries that, that have come forward in that space. Yeah, and CARICOM governments are, are, are part of that part of that Absolutely. coalition. Absolutely. You know, we talked a lot about Haiti. You know, we talked a lot about CARICOM leaders and, and as a as a body, you know, being being a leader in this space, on the negotiation space, security space, etc. You know, but these governments themselves, and these countries themselves, have their own challenges, right? Um, outside of just climate change, energy, food security, you know, um, financial de-risking, whatever it might be. There are huge capacity issues, right? Simply as by being small markets, small populations. There's only so many resources, so much human capital they can give to this issue. So, what are some of the things that Canada, maybe some other inter international partners, are doing to help provide CARICOM governments, you know, the resources, the tools to continuously remain active in Haiti? How, how are we, you know, subsidizing these costs in a way? Yeah, I mean, look, Canada has a strong and enduring relationship with the countries of CARICOM um, that, uh, that is based in, in history, that is based in strong people-to-people -people ties. We are very proud of our Caribbean uh, diaspora in Canada that uh, makes huge contributions to our, to our economic to prosperity, to our, to our society in Canada. And so, uh, as I think I mentioned to you before, uh, the Car Caribbean countries uh, are more than countries in, in our neighborhood for Canada. They are literally our family. And so those, those ties are, are strong. Um, and so Canada is very much committed to supporting CARICOM governments with respect to their um, uh, their engagement uh, in with uh, in Haiti, um, and I, I know our Prime Minister is in regular contact with CARICOM leaders to to listen to their concerns and to coordinate efforts. Um, and we've also 
been working very much with CARICOM partners because several of them, as you've, as you've mentioned, are willing to put forward resources to support the, uh, the security situation in Haiti. So um, we are providing, Canada is providing pre-deployment training to defense personnel from Jamaica, Belize, and the Bahamas. Uh, in preparation for the deployment of the multinational security support mission, and we'll continue to provide operational support uh, as the as the mission is deployed, uh, and um, we're also providing first aid training and validation exercises, which will uh, commence as uh, as early uh, as next month, and we're we're offering those to 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 Caricom. Uh, uh, battalions uh, uh, from from a hub that we've um, through which we're doing that training in Jamaica. Now that, that's that's great to hear. And you know, just staying quickly on Caricom, you know, you mentioned the Canada Caricom Summit that happened last year. Um, great to see the launch of the Canada Caricom Strategic Partnership, and and alongside that, financial commitments that go along with it. Do you think that um, you know what's happening in Haiti and the leadership that Caricom is taking? Is that going? What effect does that have on this broader Canada Caricom strategic partnership? You know, is it? Will it change? Will it continue to just go on as is? Let's get some of your thoughts there. Oh, I think it broadens and deepens that relationship. Uh, we already have a broad and deep, deep relationship with with Caricom, but the fact that our interests are converging so much uh, with respect to Haiti. Um, I think that can only broaden and deepen that that relationship with with um, uh, with with the countries of CARICOM. No, that that's great to hear, and I think that you know we were chatting before. Canada's done a great job of not just engaging regionally uh, with, with CARICOM countries, but doing so at a bilateral level as well. And I think that uh, the, the progress that Canada's made with CARICOM countries with regard to Haiti um, that's that's definitely showing the fruit of the labor. Um, I want to take a look, uh, you know, a forward-looking approach to Haiti right now. We talked about the work that Canada has done previously in the past few years. We talked about the current situation in Haiti, and we looked a little bit into the future. But you know, I'm asking an impossible question, right? If we look at a year from now, we look at five years from now, and then we look out to the next decade, what types of progress, solutions, support should we expect to materialize in those three phases? And you know, you mentioned Haitian actors needing to be at the table at every step of the way. But what are some of the other actors that need to be part of the table as well? I'm thinking IDB, World Bank, some of the non-traditional actors that haven't been there as, um, in the meantime. Yeah. No, I think. Uh, look, the, the, uh, it's really tough to look into the crystal ball on uh, on Haiti. It's such a dynamic situation, and things are changing on a day-to-day -day and hour by by hour basis. I think what. <laughs> Fair to say is that the medium term will probably depend a little bit. The medium term and the longer term, as you were saying, will probably depend a little bit on on what what happens in the short term. And we desperately need some short term successes. And there's three main areas where we need short term successes. The first is safety. The population needs to be safer, and that means strengthening the security sector. The second is addressing the most pressing humanitarian needs of the, of crisis-affected Haitians. That means food, health, education. Um, and the third area is uh, efforts to establish a governance system that will enable the organization, uh, 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 that will enable a functioning government and the organization of free and fair elections and a legitimate constitutional government. And we need those successes in those three areas to set the, the table um, for success uh, in the future. Um, so I think those are th that th that short term success will will likely um, uh, speak a little bit to to what happens in the in the medium and longer term. Um, in the meantime, I can say that in terms of next steps in collaboration with the Haitian National Police, the multinational mm -hmm. security support mission can support efforts to protect the country's infrastructure and keep Haitians safe. Um, through the efforts that we're taking to strengthen the, the, the national police, we can also ensure that it effectively responds to future threats and protects um, the most vulnerable in society. We're very supportive of continuous, of continuous engagement of CARICOM um, uh, in Haiti, and I would just call out in particular uh, Jamaica, 
as chair of the CARICOM Council for Foreign uh, and Community Relations uh, in terms of the incredible uh, leadership, uh, particularly their foreign minister has shown, um, uh, the significant leadership that the current um, uh, that the current uh, uh, president of CARICOM, President Ali of Guyana, has shown, um, as well as the former uh, president um, of, of CARICOM, the Prime Minister of uh, Dominica. Uh, and then I must also call out uh, Barbados Prime Minister Mia Motley uh, for, uh, for her incredible leadership role uh, in terms of moving things forward in this space. And so these these efforts really, uh, I would hope, would, would help support the new governance structure, and we are looking to accompany these structures towards free and fair elections. Um, but to your point, it's going to be critical for the international community, including international financial institutions, to build the resilience of the Haitian society uh, by doing more to help Haiti's long-term economic, social, and, and institutional development, um, even after the country gets back on its feet. In the next few years, um, we hope to see the results of longer-term assistance that addresses uh, the root causes of, of Haiti's uh, fragility. Um, but ultimately, the most important people uh, who, who need to be at the table and listen to are the Haitian people themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they need to insist on good, honest leadership from their uh, from their leaders uh, in the political and, and private sector uh, to ensure that their interests and the interests of their country are put in the, are put in the foreground and are really championed. Um, and we're looking forward to to supporting them. No, thank you. Uh, you know, it, it's really Im impressive to hear you know of this strategic plan over the next few years and what needs to happen in Haiti. You mentioned there's a safety aspect, there's a humanitarian aspect, there's a governance aspect. As a policymaker, as a decision maker, how, how how do you how do you prioritize that in your head when you think about the crisis uh, that the, the multiple crises that that Haiti has? You know, is it all that needs to happen in parallels, or something that needs to happen first? Let's to kind of get your you know off off top of your head and some of those thoughts. You know, I think they're all fundamental needs that people have. I don't think we have the luxury of saying one is more important than the other. I think those humanitarian, those basic humanitarian needs for, for food, for health, for education, that needs to be there. I think the secu people need to have the security and safety. Mm -hmm. Kids aren't going out to school in Haiti now because it's not safe enough for the schools to open and for the kids to go out into the streets. <clears throat> so you need to have those two things coming together. And part of that as well is, um, so, so that security element is part of it, but then you have to have a functioning state and a functioning government. So that so those three elements all need to go, uh, all need, we need to progress all of them. I don't think we have the luxury of, of selecting. We've got to help Haiti to, to move all three uh, along. And, and it seems to be a huge financial commitment. And, you know, just want to, you touched a little bit on some of the IFIs. Has there been some sort of engagement with the IFI specifically on Haiti? Um, and if there has, what does that look like? If there has not been, um, what are some of those plans or some of the things you would like to see come out of it? I haven't had those myself, so I can't comment on that today. But um, but I certainly do see a role for them. And uh, if those conversations haven't happened, you can be sure they, they will be happening. Yeah, I, I, can, I can only imagine. And, you know, we, we talked about uh, the challenges in Haiti. Uh, could you could you share a little bit, you know, to the best of your knowledge, you know, what are some of the consequences that the broader region and the hemisphere faces as well, right? And we're thinking about, talked about the partnership of the U.S. and Canada. We've talked about the partnership of CARICOM, um, the rest of the hemisphere, like Latin America. I'm sure there are going to be consequences, um, whether direct or indirect, coming out of a, a prolonged crisis in Haiti. Um, if you can share a little, it would be great to hear some of it. You know, with respect to the um, uh, to the to the uh, to the current, I'm, I'm going to go off in a different direction and come back to you. But with respect to the current um, uh, dispute uh, that's happening in South America between uh, Guyana and Venezuela over the Essequibo region, Brazilian President Lula said something very interesting. He said, "The Americas is a region of peace," and I think. Those are, those are strong words, and those are clear words, and those are true words. And I think that applies equally in Haiti. 
And although in the case of Haiti, it's not, a st it's not one state against another, it's happening within one country, that same principle needs to apply. So all of us in our hemisphere, in our neighborhood, we all need to be concerned about the stability of, uh, of Haiti. And I think that's, that, that really is the lesson here because think, things aren't necessarily contained. I mean, we see, um, we see the impacts um, with respect to other countries uh, in terms of the security uh, situation in Haiti. We see uh, Haitians uh, looking to leave their country um, uh, and uh, a country that's called the Pearl of the Antilles. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, th that's not right. Uh, it should be a country where people want to go and want to invest in um, and want to and want to make a place to uh, to have a future. And so I think we all we all we all owe it to to Haiti to really help them uh, along that along that journey, not only for them, but for the security and prosperity of of our of our region. Absolutely. The stability in Haiti is directly connected to the broader stability of the hemisphere. And you talked about how it affects the Americas, affects the broader hemisphere. Um, we'll kind of get from a Canadian perspective. Where, where is Haiti situated in this broader foreign policy for Canada? I mean, Canada has uh, clearly shown that it's an influencer of global politics and it's done well to keep Haiti top of mind. Where do you see that changing, staying the same, maybe even going up a notch um, when it comes to Canada's broader global engagement? Look, Haiti is uh, is and will, for the foreseeable future, continue to be a, a priority for Canada. We are, uh, as you mentioned, we have a significant uh, diaspora population, but it's also a country uh, in our neighborhood. So you can only expect to see uh, to see continued uh, serious uh, engagement with Haiti and with the Haitian people through uh, through the diaspora in Canada, but via our embassy in Port-au-Prince. Um, uh, in terms of engagement with, with Haitian uh, stakeholders, Haitian civil society members. Um, and I think the, uh, the significant resources and effort that we've, that, we've, uh, that we've contributed and continue to contribute to, to Haiti really do speak volumes about, um, about the extent of our, of our commitment to the country. Absolutely. And as we begin to wrap up this conversation, I want to ask you a few follow-ups. What does the immediate next step look like? We talked, we look at, you know, five, ten years down the line. Uh, what are some of these immediate next steps um, that, you know, Canada will be pursuing, MS, MSS will be pursuing, CARICOM countries pursuing? What does that look like? Well, the immediate next step is, is finalizing this transitional presidential council. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I keep checking my phone over the course of today and yesterday. Has it been finalized yet? And it still hasn't. Um, and so we're waiting for the final for the final word on that. And that really is that is really the beginning of the beginning in terms of in terms of um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of setting the table for 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 future governance. So that is that is the immediate next step. That's what we're focused on. And from that. Um, will flow a number of items with respect to um, with respect to constitutional governance, with respect to uh, security decisions that can be made, um, and with respect to uh, to to the, to the future engagement we can we can have in the country. Thank you. And as we uh, as we wrap this conversation, we want to give you an opportunity before we go to closing remarks, um, you know, an opportunity to share a final message. Right. You know. You know. Here at the Atlantic Council, you have a global platform. You already made a call to action for some of your partners around the world, but let's offer you a few minutes to kind of give some closing remarks and closing messages. Well, I mean, I just want to, to, to thank you so much for having me today. It's really a pleasure to be here, an honor to be here. Um, my, my closing remark is just that we continue to need to focus on this. This is a significant, uh, Haiti is a significant um, uh, concern. Uh, there are people who are suffering there every day. Um, and we need to focus on this as uh, as uh, a humanitarian uh, situation that deserves uh, our attention uh, as much as many of the other humanitarian situations in the world. So I would again just uh, make the call to to other donor countries um, outside of our uh, immediate region uh, to to really say, please look at what you can uh, look at what you can contribute in this space. This is this is important. Uh, there are people suffering. It may not be on the front page of the paper every day, 
but it's important. Let's really come together and contribute here. Absolutely, and I, I hope that this is uh, not your final time here at the Atlantic Council. I think that it's been absolutely fantastic to have you here sharing the great leadership that Canada is showing and portraying on the global stage when it comes to um, comes to not just Canada's foreign policy, but on Haiti, working with CARICOM leaders. And it's, it's been amazing to have you here, and I can't wait for our follow-up conversation. Um, I would now like to pivot and turn to the Atlantic Council's Executive Vice President, Jenna ben Yehuda, who is a proven thought leader in this space. Have been, I personally have been learning a lot from her comments um, all over the news, and would love to welcome her to the podium. Uh, Jenna, thank you so much. Please, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Waz, uh, and welcome, Minister Linder, um, to Washington. You've timed your travels well, arriving at peak uh, cherry blossom season. Well done. Um, I have a special uh, place in my heart for Haiti, having worked on Haiti for the last uh, 25 years, starting um, in the early 2000s and um, I think for anybody who, who works on Haiti, it um, becomes a part of who you are and you appreciate the beauty and the complexity uh, and certainly the tragedy. So we're really delighted uh, to have hosted this conversation. Uh, certainly Haiti again in the headlines uh, over the last few weeks in a really complicated and challenging dynamic. Uh, I think the Atlantic Council appreciates uh, especially how critical international support is to addressing these challenges uh, and to enabling an environment in which the Haitian people can be secure um, and determine their own future for themselves. Um, so I'd like to thank Assistant Deputy Minister Glenn Linder for joining us today. We appreciate your visit uh, and for this important conversation on a path forward. As, as you've noted, uh, Mr. Linder, in your comments, the consistent regional and global support is key. Um, some kind of continuity and path forward and a strategy that is durable over time. Um, the world is full of hard challenges, especially today, uh, and Haiti has had more than its fair share of challenges uh, in its history, uh, but that must not dissuade us from engaging at a moment so dire. Um, so here at the Council, we try to do our part by holding public and private discussions with key stakeholders across the region uh, and the hemisphere on how best to support a Haitian-led solutions. For, the, for those who have engaged on Haiti throughout your careers and your lifetimes, uh, we know that not all solutions have been Haitian-led uh, solutions. Um, and so we certainly put that at the forefront of our perspective and our thinking. Uh, there is not one clear immediate policy outcome um, just yet, though it's clear that security is dramatically needed. Um, but we look forward to playing our small part in helping to produce positive outcomes. And I think part of that is in bridging conversation um, and understanding. We know that conversations during the CARICOM heads of government meeting in Guyana and negotiations that took place in Kingston a few weeks ago had resulted in a transitional presidential council, uh, and of course, we know the impending resignation of uh, Prime Minister Henri. So we hope that this will usher in an opportunity for additional calm and transition uh, in Haiti, though I think we would be kidding ourselves to think that it will be near at hand um, or immediate, but we must not be dissuaded. So we know that the Caribbean in particular has a really critical role to play as, as neighbors uh, to Haiti, of course, and we are so privileged to have benefited from the expertise and partnership and friendship and guidance of so many Caribbean nations here at the Council and look forward to continuing to welcome you and further those conversations about how best uh, to support Haiti during this really, really challenging moment. So thank you again to everybody for joining us here today uh, and to Minister Linder for your comments. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you at our next convening. Thank you so much. Somos latinos Quiero que la unión que logre